Hey, I'm Felipe. I'm a senior software engineer at GitHub. And the menacing pyramid that will be talking with me is Dave. I'm a material science PhD student at Drexel. And we're both obsessed with Hatris. Now, as a matter of record keeping, the blog post we wrote was titled Getting the World Record in Hatris. And that is not the title of this presentation. This talk is called Impractical Rust, and it is much more about Rust, implementation details, problems we faced. Since we're coming up on Halloween, you can sort of think of this talk as a spooky story for de software developers. So let's start talking about what Hatris is. So we all know what Tetris itself is, or we probably should know. If, if you don't know what Tetris is, leave the talk now, Google Tetris, click the link, and enjoy the next several hours of wasted time. Uh, Tetris is a game in which you put blocks into wells, and the goal is to clear lines. And Hatris is exactly like Tetris with one exception. In Tetris, the pieces are random. In Hatris, the pieces are optimized against you. It will always give you the worst possible piece. As you can see here, we're trying to clear a line with nothing but S pieces, which are already bad. We say, okay, one more S piece and we'll clear that line it will not give us the S piece. It will give us the only piece that cannot clear the line. And as soon as we put it down, well, now back to Z pieces again. It, it will always give you the worst piece. And because it will always give you the worst piece, it means it's deterministic, which means you can do computationally interesting things on it. You can try to figure out what the best moves are. And like everything that is hard on the internet, people immediately tried to be the best at it and made a leaderboard. And uh, I'm one of those people, so I knew I needed to be on that leaderboard. And I was dragged along kicking and screaming the whole way. So the first question we need to address is why write this program in Rust? When we started this project, we were not exactly Rust experts. And the answer is a simple bullet point. Rust is fast and we needed a fast language. That said, there are other fast languages. And what we really wanted to do was a project in Rust that was beyond the scope of tiny toy projects. So we'd done a bunch of bad code problems. We'd spent like a month and a half trying to figure out the most optimal way to do some of them. And that had been fine, but it wasn't really capturing our attention as much as it could. And sure, we could have picked Go or C if we really wanted to deal with seg faults, but we didn't. We picked Rust. And I wanted to learn Rust specifically because the bulk of my programming experience was Mathematica. And for those of you who are not familiar with Mathematica, it is basically the highest level, most abstract, and also slowest programming language that's out there. And my favorite example of this on Stack Exchange, there is a contest called Code Golf, in which you have to solve a programming problem with as few characters as possible. And a few years ago, there was a Code Golf problem, up goat or down goat. And you were given pictures of goats, and you had to determine whether the goats were right side up or upside down. The winning program was a couple hundred characters in Mathematica, because Mathematica has a built-in function for determining whether or not a given picture is of a goat. And to go further, it even has a measure telling you how goatly that picture is on a scale of zero to one. Uh, this is incredible for a lot of things. For If you're doing rapid prototyping, this is amazing. But if you're doing production, not so much. So I wanted to balance out Mathematica with a language that was the opposite. I wanted something that was very low level or relatively low level and that was very fast. And I wanted to learn Rust because everyone on Twitter was talking about how awesome Rust was, how WASM was the future of the internet. And, you know, when has Twitter ever led me astray? I should learn Rust because it's cool and it's what everyone cool is doing. But if we had any doubts about Rust, we uh, a simple test sort of settled those doubts pretty quickly. We wrote an emulator in three languages, Mathematica, Python, and Rust. And the simple emulator in Rust was more than 100 times faster than the equivalent simple emulator in Mathematica. Uh, but this was before optimizations. We certainly could have op optimized Mathematica and Python further, but that is a huge, that's two orders of magnitude for free. And so that settled it, Rust it was. So having settled on what language we're going to write this program in, we have to figure out, okay, what are the various components? What do we need in order to beat Hatris? So the first thing we decided we needed was a way to make moves. And that would just be some kind of well representation. Pieces would drop into it. We'd figure out the terminal states of those pieces. And at the time, we didn't have a lot of vocabulary for it. It's like, yeah, we'll just have a way to make moves. So we wrote the most basic way to make moves we could. We let it run on a computer for three days, making 100 games a second. And it came back with a score of three. And we said, OK, maybe we need a way to make good moves. And having spent some time and considered that making good moves would probably be pretty good, 
we thought maybe we need a way to make better moves. So what does that actually mean in terms of things we are writing? So the first thing we need is an emulator, a state-based representation of our game that generates a game tree. And we spent a significant amount of time working on that. And that was sort of the first big block. But we also needed a way to, once we had that working, figure out what moves to make. So a way to make good moves. Traditionally, in this problem space, the way it works is you write a heuristic function. A heuristic function is a math way of representing expert knowledge. So it says, hey, take these parameters, right? The size of the well, how many holes are in the well, the shape of the well, how many turns have passed in the game, and use those to tell me whether the move I'm looking at is good or bad. Kind of the same way a chess grandmaster looks at a board and sees five or six moves that are potentially good, and those are the moves they really consider. And that sort of expert knowledge in a heuristic function is great, but there is an even better way of doing that. And that even better way of doing that is machine learning. So machine learning takes the idea of expert knowledge and says, well, what if instead of making it one math function, we made a hideous hidden black box function that had trained on a lot of games that acted as sort of an AI expert. And that we thought would be awesome. That would be the bee's knees. And we'd seen, you know, Alpha Zero had done this with the Alpha Go implementation that had cracked open Go for computers. There were a lot of expert learning systems that were sort of taking the world by storm. So we said, okay, we should write an emulator and then we should just skip this heuristic function thing and run straight into the machine learning bits. So the first step to do that was to write an emulator. So to write an emulator, we went with what you would call the quote unquote obvious approach, the approach that we as programmers saw as the most immediate way of solving this. So the idea was you start with a well, that well may have some lines in it that are already set, that well exists. Um, in that well, you put your piece, right? That piece represents the piece that the algorithm has given you. Um, you have an empty hash set, which represents all the positions that you have explored within this well. You take that piece and you say, okay, this piece can go up, that will rotate it. This piece can go to the left, that will move it to the left. This piece can go to the right, that will move it to the right. Or this piece can go down. You add those positions to your sort of graph of, that you're exploring. You take those moves and once you visit them, you add them to your hash set of explored positions. As you keep exploring, you keep adding to your hash set. Whenever you see any position, whenever you go visit a position, you make sure that's not in your hash set of explored positions. Whenever you reach a terminal position, that is, it's a position where the block is no longer going to be able to move, you add that to your list of moves because that's all the potential moves you can make within the well. And you keep going, you keep visiting positions, you eventually get some moves that you add to your thing. And at the end of it, you are out of moves, right? You're out of positions, rather. There are no more positions for you to visit. And so you run, you, you're done running your move generation. And surprise, if you think you've seen this before, you probably have, this is Dexter's algorithm and it worked really well. It was fairly fast, but of course it wasn't fast enough. We did some speed tests and the biggest bottleneck in most of our stuff was the emulator. So we knew we needed to speed up the emulator. And the first question was, where are the bottlenecks? And the first bottleneck we found was the hash function. We, store, we were storing a list of all of the positions that we'd seen, and we had to check against that list every time we had a new position that we may or may not have seen before. So at first, we used Rust's default hash set algorithm. But looking into it, that hash set algorithm was a lot more powerful than we actually needed. That, that algorithm is designed, it's cryptographically secure. It can handle arbitrarily large data types. Uh, it had a lot of things that we didn't actually need for our purposes. So we switched from hash set to the simpler uh, fowler Novo uh, algorithm. And fowler Novo FNV is actually the same algorithm used for Python dictionaries. And this by itself, the simpler algorithm, sped up our entire program by a factor of about two. But it, this was still our bottleneck at this point. And we thought, OK, if going to a simpler hash function is good, then going to an even even more simple hash function is surely better. All we really needed was uniqueness. And what we realized is there weren't that many unique bits, in, this distinct bits in the representations of the pieces. So we have seven pieces, so that's three bits. Our well is 10 wide, so the X offset is four bits. Our the well is 20 blocks high, so that's five bits. And there are four possible rotations. So that's another two bits. For a total of only 14 bits of 
significant information. We could put all of this, just we could just add all these together with, with bit shifting into a signal number and declare that that was our hash function. And this worked. This actually gave us another factor of two on top of FNV by itself, or about a factor of four against hash against the default hash set. So this was a good success, but the hashing was still even with even with this, it was still the slowest part of the uh, process. So if we couldn't we couldn't speed up the hashing any further than that, we needed instead to reduce the number of times that we called it. The first thing we did was we started a, uh, we started looking for a move the same way you would play it on the actual game. You have a piece at the very top and you examine every possible position that piece can reach from all the way to the top to all the way at the bottom. Um, but what we realized is we could skip all those empty lines in between the top and bottom. There was no there were no possible obstructions. There was nothing that was going to stop so the T piece in this case from getting from here to there. And so we could just shift it down to start with and immediately we would have far fewer positions to check and thus we would be making far fewer hash map, hash, hash set calls. But we also realized, and what we realized is not unfortunately as amenable to a GIF as these two, is that we didn't have to start with just one orientation of a T piece. We could start with all orientations from all the way to the left to all the way to the right. And in, in the process, we could skip the, the rotations themselves. We could skip the TPs having to move from the center to the left or from the center to the right. And we could shave off another dozen or so positions, maybe two dozen positions off of that. So this, this was good. But then we started looking at how are we actually storing these pieces themselves? Initially, we just, in the very first version of the emulator in Mathematica, we stored the pieces as four arrays of four by four Booleans. And the wells themselves were 20 by 10 Boolean wells. In order to check, does this piece intersect with any other pieces? We would simply do an end on, on all 200 positions within the well. And if any of the ends came up with a one, then there was an intersection and we had to, then that was not a valid position. But what we realized is that like the hash set, we could do all this bitwise and we can make, we can have the CPU do a lot of this work for us. So instead of storing it, uh, storing these positions uh, as Booleans, we could store them as individual U16s. And the nice thing about a U16 is this represents not just the entire piece, this one number represents the entire row. We went from having 200 separate values to only having 20 separate values. So having an entire, being able to directly compare the entire rows was great because now we're only doing four end statements instead of doing uh, potentially a lot more. But naturally we did not stop there. We realized we did not have to manually do the bit shifting every time or do the rotations of the pieces every time either. We could just pre-compute them all because there were not that many distinct possibilities. There were, in fact, for every piece except the O piece, there were 34 possibilities for 34 possible positions and rotations and X offsets within a given row. Uh, for the O piece, there's 36. That annoyed us no end because that means we couldn't represent it with a 32-bit integer, but it was still small enough we could fit it into a constants file pretty easily. And if we wanted to move left, we would just ref, or we wanted to move right or wanted to rotate, we would just reference a different part of this same preloaded piece list array. So this again, sped things up. A lot of these things are sort of obvious improvements. Um, and in hindsight, yeah, they definitely are obvious. But when you're doing all this for the first time, it's still, you still start off with the Booleans. You know, if you've never done something like this before, you'll start off with the least efficient representation and you'll move on to things like this. But that wasn't fast enough for us either. And so ultimately we decided to do something that was not based on hashing individual pieces because no matter how much we improved it, hashing individual pieces was still too slow. So what we would look at is a slice of a well, a four line slice, because that's how many, 
if you have a given piece and you rotate it, the piece can reach uh, anywhere within a four by 10 area before having to move down. All of these in that you're seeing in the GIF are rotations and movements in the X direction. And what we invented what is what we called a waveform. And a waveform is a representation of every possible position with a zero if the position is invalid and a one if the position is valid. With this, we can store very succinctly all of the possible positions that a piece could have in this given four line slice of a well. And the key discovery we made is that a waveform plus a four line slice of a surface will always give you the same identical waveform one block down. So if we, we could cache that, we could store that in a cache and simply reference the combination of previous waveform and new surface slice to get new waveform. This meant that we had to get a really big cache. Our constants file at this point was 20 megabytes, but the cache was looking like it was gonna be gigabytes. And we decided that even we were not going to make a source file with gigabytes if we didn't have to. So instead we started importing it. And the imports led to some very interesting problems, which we will talk about. But for right now, this gave us a huge improvement over what, where we were before. And so you can see our initial unoptimized emulators were on the order of 250 milliseconds per move. Our initial Rust emulator was on the order of a one millisecond per move. And our final Rust emulator, the waveform-based emulator, with as large of cache as we could reasonably fit in memory, we got down to less than 50 microseconds per move per core. And so combining all of that, we were looking at around five and a half orders of magnitude improvement from the very first, very unoptimized emulator to the very fastest, very final version of it. That was huge. That was essentially, we were talking before the talk started about uh, uh, individual computers versus distributing computing. But this was as if we had 27,000 computers to work with compared to the sort of things we could accomplish without optimizing. So that was, that was crucial. And being able to do 50, mil, 50 microseconds per move per core allowed us to do some things that we would never have been able to do even with the initial version in Rust. So Dave has uh, thrown the word core around, and that brings us naturally to multi-threading. And I'm going to introduce multi-threading, and then I'm going to talk about some specific multi-threading things we've done. So if you've never heard of multi-threading before, the core idea behind multi-threading is that computers have multiple cores. And each of those CPU cores can theoretically run an individual instance of a program or a subroutine of your choice. So in theory, we had four cores on the machines we were running. We said, cool, we can probably run at least the program at least four times faster, even if we just run four instances of the program. It turns out it's not quite as easy as that, but that was the that's the foundational idea, right? You have cores, you want to distribute your workload. So the first thing to understand when you're trying to do any type of distributed multi-core work is what is the problem you're dealing with? So what we were dealing with was a Monte Carlo tree search. And that's not totally true because we had a distributed cyclic graph technically a distributed cyclic graph tree search or a distributed cyclic graph Monte Carlo search, but the tree search will explain the concepts we're dealing with pretty well. So the sort of idea that happened that happens with the Monte Carlo search is you have your initial game state, right? In our case, an empty well. And from there, you would like to figure out what moves to make. So you have your initial well that has, in our case, 17 potential moves. You look at those 17 moves and you find which of those moves is the best move, whatever, however way you're doing it, however you're doing it. So in our case, initially it was a neural net or the highest score. At later points, we applied a heuristic method, but regardless, you pick whichever move is the best. You look at all those moves, children, you evaluate those, and then you propagate values up the tree that say, hey, you should probably pick this move or no, maybe you should go look at a different move. And you keep doing this over and over again. You pick another node, you expand that node, you propagate some values up. You pick a node, you expand a node, you propagate those values up, and you keep doing that until your hyperparameters say, hey, you've done enough node expansions. Pick one of these nodes and go and make, make that your next move. You pick the best node, that's your next move, and then you start the process over again from that node. It's great. It's a very well understood process for solving these types of game tree problems. 
And it's what we were trying to multi-thread. And fortunately, we were not the first people to multi-thread a Monte Carlo tree search. So there's a few different potential approaches to multi-threading and NCTS. Um, the sort of first basic one that, that most problems start with is leaf parallelization. And the idea there is you take your node, you have a bunch of children in it, you expand all those children, and you just hand each child to a threaded process to expand so that you can do multiple expansions simultaneously. That works great when you have low numbers of leaf nodes and maybe you want to just, and your expansion process is time consuming. That was not the problem we had here. Um, we in fact had a lot of children per node and our expansion process was not all that time consuming. So that was not really the solution we wanted to go with. The sort of next general idea is root parallelization. And this is the brute force, I don't feel like figuring out multi-threading really prop solution, which is you just run various instances of the whole game tree. You have your, you have your graph of nodes, you clone it however many thread times you have, you run those threads and you have them run a full game of exploration. Um, you need to have some way of making them not return the same results in a deterministic way. So that's already a challenge, and it wasn't really going to work for us because we were trying to optimize for our hardware limitations. So running, using up all our memory and running multiple graphs was probably not the best option. The sort of third general option is tree parallelization with a global mutex. And I haven't yet talked about what a mutex is, but it's a way of sharing a data structure. So the idea of tree parallelization with a global mutex is since you already have your graph and you've generated it once, you might as well just um, keep sharing that graph between all your various processes that are going to be running exploration. So instead of having four copies of the graph, you have one copy of the graph and you run as many explorations as your course can support. The fourth option, which is, I would argue, probably the best if you're doing a tree search, is tree parallelization with local mutexes. And so the idea behind that is you make mutexes of your subgraphs so that you can run explorations in parallel across your smaller subtrees. Now, the reason that can't work for us is because we have graph, an acyclic directed graph. So you're going to run into situations where two mutexes are trying to explore the same node. They go into different graphs, and then at the end, you have to reconcile these graphs in a way that makes sense, and it becomes a giant painful mess. So we just stuck with tree parallelization with the global mutex. Great. So what is a mutex? So mutex stands for mutual exclusion, which is something I learned when I was doing this project, and it solves the problem of how do you share data structures in threaded situations. So imagine a world where you don't know what a mutex is. You say, hey, I have this beautiful graph. It is full of a bunch of nodes. I would like to be able to explore these nodes in parallel. So you take your function and you say, cool, I made a thread spawner function. And that thread spawner function will run my exploration routine. And I will just pass the graph into it. Rust will tell you, no, you can't do that. Uh, once you, you once you pass that in, that is a that is borrowed and you can't do that. So you say, cool, no problem. I will just pass a reference to that graph. So you pass in the reference to the first thread, everything is working fine. But the second thread goes to pick up the reference and says, wait, this is already borrowed. I can't use that. And so the borrow checker once again yells at you and you shake your fist at the sky and you go to Google and you say, how do I share a data structure in threads? And then you Google that and the first answer that comes up is you should use a mutex, which is a type of semaphore, but a semaphore is not a type of mutex. And you're like, what the heck is this talking about? And so then you look at a bunch of diagrams and you arrive at this. The idea of a mutex is actually really, really simple. So a mutex is a data structure that wraps another data structure and implements basically three methods on it. It implements lock, unlock, and check to see if it's locked. So the way it works is you put this data structure around your graph, and then you have you share it around. So you have two threads that are trying to access it. The first thread says, hey, I want to access this mutex. Well, I better lock it so no one else can access it while I'm accessing it. It does all the things it needs to do, pulls out some data, modifies some things in that graph, and then it lock, unlocks it and says, okay, whoever else needs it needs to use it. If while thread A has, the, has it locked, thread B comes around and says, hey, I'd also like to access that graph. It sees that the graph is locked and it just pauses and waits for thread A to finish doing the thing and unlock the graph. When thread B goes to pick it up, it locks the graph again, does its thing. If thread A comes along at the same time and says, actually, I need that graph back, it has to wait until thread B is finished and so on and so forth. It works really well. It's a great process for sharing your resources, but if you've heard this description or if you've worked in multi-thread problems before, you can probably already imagine some of the issues that emerge with mutexes. And that's what we're gonna talk about now. So if you have a mutex, there are sort of two conditions you need to really worry about. 
In our specific case, I'm going to describe the architecture we have because it's now relevant. We had two mutexes. We had a mutex for the graph and a mutex for the net. So the idea being, when we're doing exploration, our program rolls around, it goes through the graph, it picks a bunch of nodes that it thinks are good, it expands those. Once it expands those nodes, those children need to be evaluated to see what their scores are. But doing a neural net pass is actually super time consuming if you do it for each node. So we put all these nodes into a queue. Um, when those threads all finished a round of exploration, we would put the, we would put the um, nodes into the neural net and we'd get evaluations back and we'd add them back to the graph. Great, except in the scenario where a node is, we have some exploration running, it locks the graph so that it can do some things. Um, the neural net is running, it says, oh, hey, I need the graph. Great, no problem, it waits around. Um, the thread that is doing exploration unlocks the graph and the neural net grabs it. But if you run into a situation where the neural net is waiting for the graph to unlock and the graph is waiting for the neural net to unlock, you're just stuck. And we run into those several times. So a way of solving that problem is you just make sure your threads hold on to it to let go of your net and your graph as soon as possible. They just unlock the mutex as soon as they're done. Unfortunately, if you need to access your graph a bunch of times, you incur a huge overhead of just locking and unlocking, which is actually surprisingly computationally intensive just because it's an extra operation on top of your graph access. And if you hold on for it for too long, which is the opposite scenario, right? you just say, okay, this thread spawns, it immediately opens the graph. And when it's done doing everything that unlocks the graph, then you might as well not bother threading because all your other threads are going to be waiting around. So that is a gigantic pain in the butt. And it's a problem that you just have to optimize as you go through your code and figure out where are the areas where I can afford to drop this early and where there is where I can't. Um, I also want to mention a sort of a side note. One thing I learned while doing this project that I didn't know before is that to do to have shared references in Rust, you need to use a special wrapper called ARC. So if you ever have to have a shared reference, you get to wrap it in ARC. And so all over our code, there were a bunch of ARC mutexes and ARC various things that we needed to share with the threads. So great, that's mutexes. There is one sort of final fun little bug that we discovered when we were doing this process. So as I've described, we would go along, right? We'd have several threads exploring and um, we found that consistently those threads would all pick the same nodes to explore, which makes sense. They're all looking at the same graph. There is a node that has a score of, let's say hypothetically 10. So they all see that score of 10 and say, oh yeah, that's that's the one we want. The one that you've evaluated to be, have a value of 10, great. We'll all grab that and put it into the queue to expand and to have evaluated in the neural net. That's not ideal when you're trying to distribute your exploration. So we had to come up with a solution for that. And so we did some reading and we found um, a paper on parallel Monte Carlo tree searches. And what they used for to solve that problem was something called virtual loss. And we said, great, this sounds useful. Let's implement it. So the idea behind virtual loss is that whenever one of your exploring, exploring threads finds a node, it adds a property to that node called virtual loss. That is some arbitrary metadata that you've decided, some score modifier, and it reduces the score of that node. So tree or thread one is exploring, it finds a node with a score of 10. It says, great, I'm going to add this to the queue and I'm going to give it a virtual loss score of one. Thread two is now exploring the tree. It sees that same node. It said, oh good, a score of 10. It grabs the node and then it says, oh wait, this is virtual loss of, of one. So its score is actually only nine. And then it looks around and sees, are there any other nines I can grab instead? If there aren't, great, that's fine. And then we move on with our lives. If there aren't any others, rather, we um, keep this in one so we can look at the children. If there are others, we just grab the other one and use that one instead, and assign it virtual loss and all that fun stuff. This introduces two complications. One is you have to backpropagate your virtual loss as you are navigating. And two, you need to make sure you clear your virtual loss whenever you've selected a move. We ran into both of those issues. So speaking of issues, there is a final virtual loss kind of related issue that I want to talk about, and it's the ghost nodes. So I warned you ahead of time that there were going to be ghost stories in here. So ghost nodes were a issue that emerged when our evaluation queue just had a bunch of children in it, and we'd go to the graph to grab that child, and it would be mysteriously gone. It wouldn't be there and our program would crash because we'd get a we wouldn't be getting the value we were expecting and everything would be off so we said okay we need to figure out why these ghost nodes are happening i mean obviously we must be clearing them during our graph cleanup phase maybe we're just not adding them to the graph correctly let's find out what's going on and so we started hunting around and um we just couldn't replicate it consistently it would happen in one in 20 one in 30 runs randomly um, it would always happen if the number of threads was greater than one, so we knew it was multi-threading related. Um, 
And as it went on, we just could not find a consistent explanation as to why it happened repeatedly, or we couldn't recreate it even with the same data over and over again. It just happened. So we um, eventually decided to paper over it. We said, if you go to look for this node in the graph and it's not there, it's a ghost node, just ignore it. Um, and so you ignore the ghost nodes and that's it. That's how we solved that problem because we couldn't solve it. Uh, we did a lot of thinking and we think our running theory is that the evil forces of hatred infiltrated the uh, program itself and corrupted it. And so that's why we had ghost nodes. And so, yeah, we, um, we did encounter other errors aside from just the ghost node, although the ghost node was perhaps the spookiest. Uh, when we started this with Rust, anyone who's worked with Rust knows what it's like to have the borrow checker yell at you. Uh, that was not scary at all. We knew that was coming. When we were doing Advent of Code, I collected all of the unique compiler error messages that I got. I only got up to 16, but in my defense, we only did six days and didn't have time to get into some of the more exotic errors. So if you see a compiler error, fine, no problem at all. If you see a panic, eh, you're a little bit worried, but the panic is still not that bad. But if it doesn't even manage to panic successfully, now you should worry. And this, so this happened um, we, we think due to Linux having a limited thread count. We thought we were only using 20 or so threads at a time, but we were either not dropping them fast enough or not dropping them at all or something. We're not sure in, entirely what it was, but we Googled around for this error. We found somebody who mentioned the error and mentioned a possible solution. And that possible solution had words like stack space and new limit. So we thought this guy knows his stuff. And so we ran the code and the code worked fine. We recommend running code that you don't understand on production machines. It, it's worked out well for us. This uh, it's what we're pretty sure this does is simply uh, makes it so that there is no upper limit or no practical upper limit to the number of threads you can have. And thus, if we're dropping them, if the problem is we're not dropping them fast enough, this gives us plenty of time to drop them before encountering a problem, but still, this is the first time we ever saw Rust not even be able to panic successfully. But that was not the spookiest. The spookiest was the load bearing print statement. So when we switched from the MCTS to the, well, when we uh, switched to the waveform emulator, we needed to import some caches from external files. In fact, we needed some fairly enormous caches in order to fit all the waveforms that we'd seen. But Rust has a solution for this. The save file crate allows you to store structures on disk and import them. And yeah, that was great. It worked, uh, worked wonderfully. So we did it. But then we encountered another problem. Multi-threading has requirements on the lifetime of the, your data. And if you import it, that means it was not always there. If you want to pass data to, mul to more, more than one thread, you need a static lifetime. But if you import it, it can't be a static, it can't be a static lifetime because it was not known during compile time. So our solution to that was to use lazy static when importing. Now, lazy static is another crate that Rust has. And again, this, this is specifically what it's designed to do. And for a single thread, it worked fine. However, when for multiple threads, we had a problem. Namely, as soon as we imported anything, the program immediately stack overflowed. And our solution was to just start making print statements to debug it. We had no idea what, why this was happening. It worked fine in single threads. Make some print statements, see where it's happening, how far we get. Yeah, it was the best idea we had. And that worked. That fixed the problem. There, the code now ran perfectly. So our solution was to never remove those print statements ever again. These, this is still in our code to this day. Um, what we suspect happened is that the child threads being spawned had a lot less stack space than the main thread. And lazy static does not actually imp cause the imports to happen until the structure is first invoked. So if we invoke this structure in the main thread before we run anything, that's fine. Uh, it, the main thread has plenty of stack space. We can import everything and it works. But if we try to do that in a child thread, the invocation doesn't have nearly enough stack space to finish. Uh, we also don't know, maybe child threads have less memory instead of uh, just stack space problems. Maybe it's a problem of the child thread imports it, but then 
a parallel child thread tries to access it and can't. We're not entirely sure, but regardless, those print statements uh, are there and the code will break if we don't have them. And that was how we fixed most problems. We fixed most problems with print statements as, as opposed to you know, anything else. Well, I mean, we didn't talk about unit tests to solve problems. So this is a visual representation of our unit tests structure. Um, we talked a lot about writing unit tests. We spent a lot of time in Discord saying, oh man, this would be a lot easier to solve if someone had written a unit test for this. But um, there was one specific bug where we had a back propagation wasn't back propagation wasn't working properly. Specifically, virtual loss was not going all the way up through the parent nodes. And we said, well, we debug, we'll debug this. We wrote a bunch of print statements. We clawed our way up the call stack. We found all the various places where we were, in fact, calling virtual loss. And it turns out we just didn't remember to include it in the parent function. Um, and that took us a week of debugging time where our unit test would have caught that in about two minutes. So we would have probably saved some time if we'd written those unit tests. We did a whole rewrite of using waveforms. And uh, that introduced a bunch of regressions because it turns out we had two branches where we're doing the waveform rewrite and we just forgot to copy some code over. And if we had some unit tests, we would have seen that because the unit tests would have either been wrong or there wouldn't have been enough of them. In general, we saved a lot of time not writing unit tests because we didn't have to muck around with figuring out how to do it. But we wasted about three times that much time by having to debug complex problems that were just really difficult to solve using only print statements. Um, that said, we had Rust types in the borrow checker to sort of save our bacon when we were doing the complex refactors. Otherwise, I think we'd still be trying to refactor some portions of the code where we, there were just a bunch of errors. Um, all that said, we've, of course, had panics to rely on. So you could always just have a, oh, yeah, if this happens, panic statements, because there's really no side effects of panicking. So that was useful and helpful. And so one, one method we did use, uh, not for finding errors, but for finding... Uh, for optimizing code was flame graphs. And what flame graphs are, are visual representations of how much time the CPU spends on any given function. And it's nested so that a function on top of another, if one function calls two more, that function will have two sections uh, on it. You can see how there are all these various peaks. These peaks are where you have many, many nested functions, all one inside the other. And this was the very first flame graph we ever ran. Uh, on the right side, you can see a whole lot of hash maps. And this was more or less expected. We knew hash maps were going to be our limiting factor. Uh, we knew we were, we had some ideas about the switching to FNVs that we we're going to implement. So that didn't concern us much. What concerned us was the giant mountain in the middle, because that's not something we expected at all. And tracing through that, that, that was a single formatting statement for a panic. And it was a panic in case of an error, uh, in case of a bug that we had actually already fixed. So this was a panic statement that was never actually getting called, but it had to do the formatting every single time anyway. And it took, was taking up a full 16% of our total runtime by itself. So no, it, it, th this was without any other optimizations and it was still taking up an eighth of our time. If we ran this, if we had this still in, our code today, we probably would be taking up well over 90% of our time. And I still wouldn't have guessed that it was this. Uh, I would have had no idea that formatting for panics that don't actually get called was that expensive. So that that's something we, we were grateful for. And that's something we did do systematically, unlike unit tests. And I invite everyone to think about how many unused panics they might have in their code base. Or just un underthought things, uh, things that you haven't that you haven't profiled it because if you're not if you're not measuring, you're not optimizing. That's what we learned by doing the flame graphs and throughout this whole project. So the other thing that flame graphs alerted us to was when we were fundamentally using the wrong kinds of structures. Uh, when we moved from MCTS to Beam Search, we needed, long story short, to be able to store about 25 million items in a single vector or in a single structure of some kind, I should say. We initially use vectors. We initially use the vec structure. Uh, we need to be able to insert into arbitrary spots in this structure and we need the structure to be sorted. Um, so we use vec on small beams. This worked fine. 
on large beans, this had a huge increase. This is not just an increase in uh, the total time. This is an increase in the average time needed to make a move. And you can see that we were rapidly undoing all of that precious, precious optimization that we'd done with the emulator earlier. Eventually, we got the bright idea to run a flame graph on this. And we saw that insertion for a beam width of a million was taking up roughly 90% of runtime. So that, that was not good. And we eventually realized that this was because vectors, that while they have very fast read times, we can do a binary search to figure out where to insert very quickly, but they have order n write times because the whole point of a vector is that all the, everything's in a predictable spot in memory. If you insert in the middle, you have to reallocate everything to the right of it. Uh, and the longer your vector is, the worse this gets. So our next thought was linked lists. Linked lists, be, because linked lists, you have extremely fast insertion. The problem is figuring out where to insert in the linked list, if you're inserting somewhere in the middle and not on the ends, would be just as hard as inserting would be on a vector. Uh, and so for neither one of these did we get both. We needed both arbitrary index insertion and arbitrary index read. And we needed something that was relatively fast for both. And so I talked to dad and dad suggested a B tree. And fortunately Rust had a built-in B tree out implementation. We didn't have to write one of our own. B trees have logarithmic insert times and logarithmic read times. And at this point, looking at this graph, we were willing to accept basically any constant on top of those logarithms. So we implemented B trees and it went from about 90% of runtime to less than 1% instantly. And that, that problem was solved entirely. So if you don't know what you're doing, if you did not have a, uh, a good computer science class or if you've forgotten it all, measuring what you're doing, you can, you can sort of rediscover the things that you should have known already. Uh, it is extremely helpful. And it's just one of the things that Flame Graphs helps us with. Uh, because a lot of times our bottlenecks are not where we expect them to be. Uh, if you're a Rust developer, you have probably used the clone function before. And if you're like us, you've probably worried about it because using the clone function, instead of borrowing things and passing references and doing it properly, is not idiomatic Rust. Cloning is a kludge. And our code has dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Uh, we, we actually did a check. It's well over 70. Um, we used it to deal, make dealing with a borrow checker easier. And then we found out as we optimized, we never saw clones on our flame graph. They weren't actually slowing us down. And even the official Rust crate suggests this. And the official Rust crate says that our experience is not uncommon. In a lot of cases, the compiler just optimizes away the clone function. Uh, you can call clones and unless, it, unless it's egregious, the compiler will take care of it all for you. Got it. There are no ethical consequences for abusing clones. So we've talked a bunch about flame graphs. We've talked some about multi-threading. It's time to talk about machine learning. So for the machine learning component of our project, we use TCH. And when we first started Googling, we just Googled machine learning Rust libraries and came upon TCH-RS. TCH and we saw, oh, PyTorch, we know what that is. That's in Python machine learning things. And so you can read the description we saw on the repo there. And if you're like me, it probably doesn't mean much to you. So what it actually means, and when you actually get down to brass tacks, is that if you go and set up all your dependencies correctly, and you configure everything properly, you will get all the building blocks of machine learning. You can make neurons. You can make networks that connect those neurons together. You can apply functions to the neurons. You can just build it from scratch. It's awesome. For us, the process was a little bit like a child trying to make dinner in a five-star kitchen. We had all the tools we needed. They were all laid out beautifully. And we spent a lot of time asking things like, how do I turn the stove on? What is the spatula? Fortunately, there's a whole field of machine learning experts out there in the world. So if you're interested in doing machine learning with TCH, we suggest you go find one of them. That's not us. So instead, we're going to talk about some of the things we did with the TCH crate that would maybe get us tried at the machine learning hog. So customizing TCH for multi-threading. So one of the first problems we ran into with this was we got our neural network working. It was a painstaking and challenging process, but it was working. 
sort of, we could train it. It took like two weeks to generate a terrible network and we could use it to evaluate nodes. And so we're, set, we're thinking, we're like, okay, we're ready to speed up this program. We should multi-thread this net so that it can do multiple evaluations in parallel. Great. So I just take this net, I wrap it on an arc mutex, I give it to my thread, and I get an error that says, um, you, can't, you can't wrap this in a mutex. It doesn't implement sync and send. Specifically, the C tensors in it don't implement sync and send. And I don't know. I know a tensor is machine learning related. It's one of these... Um, building blocks that builds up a neural network and it's part of neurons, but I, I don't understand why it doesn't implement sync or send. So I say, okay, no problem. I can just implement sync on C tensor right here in my mainline code. And of course, Rust doesn't like that. You're not allowed to implement properties for functions that are for things that you don't own. So the, it won't let me do it because it's in a crate. I said, okay, that's fine. I'll just fork TCH and make these things syncable. So I fork TCH, I added these two unsafe lines of code. I did absolutely no testing to make sure that they didn't blow up my program or have any adverse consequences. And then I just linked that in the crates.io. And that's great. Everything worked. We were able to multi-thread our TCH. Now, if you have any experience in distributed computing, you know that what we did is something you should very much not do because you don't know when you're going to run into unsafe memory conditions. And my understanding of the crate is very bare bones. So I have no way of verifying that I, did just, that I didn't just create a situation where our entire program blows up for no reason or overwrites arbitrary memory or does awful, awful things no Rust program should be allowed to do. Our, so our understanding do of the word unsafe in this context is simply that if you declare something unsafe, the compiler skips all the normal protections it does and says, okay, you declared this unsafe, you take care of these protections. Uh, and we didn't. So yeah. if you if you are implementing something like this, that word unsafe does mean you have to you have to care a lot more about what you're doing with memory than you normally do with Rust. Normally, yeah. Rust is very, very good about not letting memory issues happen ever. Yeah, well, that's not the only unsafe thing we did, but it is one of them. But eventually, we could not get a neural network to train well enough. We still have some ideas on how, in theory, you could do you could use data on the scale of one laptop or one desktop computer, but we couldn't we couldn't get it in any reasonable amount of time. So instead of that, we decided to steal an expert heuristic, and we stole the expert heuristic that the current world record holder at the time had kindly uh, published online. However, this expert heuristic had a bunch of parameters and we didn't actually know what values those parameters should have. For instance, it weighted, whole, it weighted negatively for holes in the well. If you had a bunch of pieces, but there was a hole, it said that hole is bad. But we didn't know from the documentation how bad. And we didn't have any specific numbers to tell us how bad. So somehow we needed to figure that out by ourselves. And we are not Tetris experts. There was no way we were gonna get decent numbers just by guessing. So ideally, there is, we would use some method of, uh, of learning those numbers. What we found, unfortunately, was that there, right now there are not good crates in Rust for getting those values. So the first thing we looked at was Bayesian optimization. And Bayesian optimization has, has upsides. Uh, we've used it before in previous projects. It, is well suited for this sort of problem where you have roughly on the order of 10 parameters on the order of a thousand data points since it's uh, order n cubed in terms of uh, the amount of time it takes to compute the next point from given existing points. The problem is that there are no Rust impl implementations that we could find or there were no Rust implementations as of a few months ago that we could find. And the math behind implementing it ourselves looked quite scary. There was no way we were gonna be able to implement this successfully on our first try. And we really didn't wanna take the amount of time it would, it would take in order to do a full Bayesian opti optimization crate ourselves. And if you Google how to implement Bayesian optimization from scratch, you'll get about a dozen more or less identical clickbait articles saying how to implement Bayesian optimization from scratch in Python. But then going down halfway, it says, all you need is this existing Python module that implements Gaussian kernels, which is where all the math comes in. Everything else is very basic compared to the Gaussian kernels. So uh, we, if there is a very easy method to implement it, we couldn't find it. 
and we couldn't uh, find a crate that had found it either. So we needed something simpler. And we did find a crate called Simple X Optimization. Uh, so this, as this is a crate already. We didn't have to optimize it. That was definitely a plus. And it is relatively simple algorithm. Every new point is only order n in the number of points that come, came before. Uh, given that each of these points takes about six hours to generate, uh, it would be years probably before it was taking so long to generate a point that the time became a problem. Uh, that was perfectly fine. The downside is we are not actually sure if this converges at all. Uh, if it does, it can, seems to converge quite slowly. There's, uh, you can, the initial calibration, uh, before going into the actual optimization part, the algorithm takes some of the corners of your parameter space and it checks those corners. And that's not influenced by the data at all. It'll check those corners regardless of how good or bad they are. And some of those corners turned out to be pretty good indeed, uh, getting us over 160 moves. And then afterwards, it never approached those corners ever again. We're not sure what it was doing. We're not sure if we implemented it correctly or what the deal was. But since there was no method built into the crate to resume a search after pausing one or to, to take prior results and use that to jumpstart a search or something, uh, there was nothing really more we could do. But I can't smack talk it too much because it did, in fact, give us a set of parameters that got us the world record by a full 20 points. And originally, this talk just sort of ended. And we thought it'd be kind of a shame not to see what all of this actually translates to in terms of a real game of Hatris. For about 11 months, we spent most of our time thinking about this game in very abstract terms, wells and moves and shapes and graphs. We weren't looking at individual games. Which is fine, because fundamentally, this is a programming problem. We wouldn't be giving a programming talk otherwise. There's a bunch of uninteresting but nice things Rust did for us, some that we've mentioned slightly, but it was mostly protecting us from ourselves, not letting us screw up type starting refactors, keeping our threads mostly safe via the borrow checker. We're pretty confident if we picked a different language, we'd still be waiting for that beam search to finish running. If you've ever played real Tetris, and we were talking about this beforehand, you'll know that you would never, ever play a real game of Tetris this way. And it is wild to see pieces stacked like this all the way up to the ceiling and know that there is still another 40 points to go. If you've ever played Hatris, you probably know that you would still never play a game this way. The world record 30 points that lasted for seven years was nothing like this. It was a simple, elegant pseudo loop strategy that just repeated the same strategy over and over again. And that's what's so cool about this project. It seems simple on the surface, but there's a whole world of hidden complexity inside. And so much like the game, our code itself was this maze of alien abstractions stacked on top of each other that we didn't really understand. But much like the game, it worked. Actually, I don't want to leave slideshow yet. All right, questions? Uh, I have uh, some non-technical question. Absolutely. Uh, so you guys work at GitHub. Uh, I I like to know uh, what's the percentage of people, a percentage of programmers who who know how to use uh, AI to make inference, and how what's the percentage would know how to build a model and to train it. Uh, I don't honestly have real numbers to put to that. Uh, GitHub guess. engineering team is really, really large and I'm not super in touch with the AI parts of it. So I don't know. <laughs> it's not going to be evenly distributed, I suspect. Uh, I'm yeah. not at GitHub and among the programmers I, I work with, every, all the programmers I work with are programmers for other things. They are doing research primarily and they're doing programming <coughs> in, in pursuit of that research. Uh, I don't know any anyone at Drexel in my department who would do this, but I am not in the computer science department. The, it might be 100% of the computer science department for all I know. Uh, well, yeah, I just don't have a good answer for you, unfortunately. Uh, it's, it's a big trend. I, I believe several years down the road, programmers will, will need to use their code to drive AI to do things. 
So there will AI will be the thing in between a programmer's job, a programmer's work, and the real task to be a, accomplished. <laughs> yeah, I can buy that. Yeah, I can believe that. Whether that's a good idea necessarily, I don't know. But I could definitely see that happening regardless of whether or not it's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, not sure if I missed a point while you were presenting it, but my mind keeps going back to those, uh, the ghosts. The, go the, uh, the goats? Ghosts. Oh, ghosts. Uh, the ghost ghosts. Ghost. Yes. And what is it that prevented, if you have two threads trying to check at the exact same time, would those have created a child without it being functional? Uh, it's unlikely we considered it, but the mutex structure means that- uh, that You overshot uh, 19. Oh, no, I was going for the mutex diagram, actually. Oh, okay, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. I think the mutex would prevent that from happening because there's no way for a thread to be accessing the graph at the same time as another thread. And I think generation was pretty impotent in that it wasn't really overlapping with other generations, okay. but- it's, I mean, it's theoretically possible at this point, the code is so muddled that I <laughs> genuinely have no idea how that bug happened. What's one of those things that tickles the brain, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it tickled ours. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. uh, in theory, it shouldn't have been possible uh, because we did implement mutexes for everything. And if we had, if we had missed something, if we hadn't implemented mutexes for everything, it wouldn't just be one ghost node every 20 or 30 runs. It would be happening... Uh, it would be happening every move. Yeah, I thought the fact that the rarity of it happening and the oddity of it happening, given the setup presented, that it would have to be a very odd reason. Yes. For it. That's why I thought, hey, worth asking. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It and definitely I, is. Yeah, if we uh, had an answer for that question, we wouldn't have this slide. <laughs> <laughs> I think is how, what it comes down to. <coughs> At least we got a good slide about, out of it. Yes. Um, I think I have explanation for your oh, brain statements. Oh, okay. So, uh, as you said, it's not working when it's uh, running in different threads, but by printing all of them in a single thread, you're basically forcing all those uh, things to evaluate ahead of time. Oh, so you don't that really was... need to print it. It's enough just to calculate the length itself. So that's oh, what you Yes, that say. was uh, uh, for the load bearing print. That Yeah, that was a different error, but I'm pretty sure you're right. Uh, it certainly is a lot less mysterious. That one is almost certainly because it's uh, because lazy static doesn't, in, doesn't import until the in first invocation. Uh, and length requires a full invocation. Um, I did a quest, uh, two questions, but this is uh, one. Do you, do you have any sense of how much lower the score would be if you had exactly one less line to work with or how much higher the score would be if you had exactly <laughs> one more line? It like, is, would, uh, it be, would it blow, like, if you, especially, like, if you, if you had one more line, do you have any theory of, like, okay, uh, the game would play almost exactly the same, but it would continue, or the game would just be totally different if you had one more line to work with. We, uh, as a matter of fact, we investigated this. Uh, and give me a moment, and I, I will pull that up myself. Do you want to share your screen, Dave? I can stop. Yes, yes, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, okay. So this, I'll show you the first one. This is from the blog itself. So we did do a series of calculations on the maximum game length. And for the first, up until a height of seven, this is definitive. We did a complete analysis of the game tree. We did not do a partial analysis, which is what the beam search is. Um, based on this, it seemed like it was quadratic. Uh, it, is, it is definitely not easy to take that from just seven points, but it's roughly, it, 
it's roughly consistent with the kind of score we eventually got. Uh, we suspect that this is approximately quadratic. There's, I was calling it the Towers of Hanoi effect, uh, even though that's not quite right. Because what we were seeing in our game is that it seems like the best move is to stack everything up to the top and to keep it stacked up to the top as long as possible. The way Hatress calculates the worst move is it calculates the highest filled line, the highest line that has any pieces on it. So if you stack all the way up to the top, you're giving the Hatress algorithm the least amount of information possible to work with. It, I suspect that an optimal game would stack things all the way up to the top the entire way. Um, and if you st st stack things all the way up to the top the entire way, you would be able to, uh, uh, I suspect you'd encounter something like this. You'd expect, yeah, I think you'd see something like this trend line and getting a maximum score of maybe 100. I have a lot more that unfortunately I, it is not, uh, it's not in graph form, but I will pull up, uh, Felipe, can you share your screen again? It'll take me a minute I to can. pull this up. Uh, let me make sure I'm sharing the correct but screen. I, we also did a test of a beam, beam width up to a million for every well height from uh, from 2 to 16. And that was all, that was pretty interesting. Uh, well height test. No, that's not it. Yeah, I have comments on two technical details. Yes. Uh, Let's hear one, it. one is about training. And the, the, uh, the chart you showed that uh, the, the data were very uh, discrete. It's, it's hard to converge. I, I wonder if, uh, if you ever thought about just uh, record human play and uh, use it as, as a data augmentation method. So actually when we're doing machine learning training in general, we did consider looking at human play. The issue is humans are very, very, very bad at hatred. And it was actually, I think the data I generated by end, it wasn't very much, was worse than just moves at random for the most part. <laughs> it, uh, there is just, you're, you're probably used to thinking of things like chess or, uh, uh, or Go or something like that, where there is a lot of human data out there. There isn't. Uh, pe people do not enjoy, people love the concept of this game, but you don't find many people who go out on an afternoon and spend an afternoon playing it because it is miserable to actually play. Uh, well, that's why we're doing this machine learning rather than trying to do it ourselves. The highest score that we know of that was purely human was only 30 points. Uh, and the record when we were doing this project was 66 points. Yeah. There was, Beyond that there too, was there is no one way. 30 point data point. Like there's not a bunch of 29s and 27s. There's one 30 score. Yes. It just wasn't enough to, uh, it, it wasn't going to be enough to go on. Okay. Which, uh, my second question is about uh, VEC. Uh, you compared the insertion of VEC, linked list, and uh, B tree, and I, I wonder, uh, you have to do insertion. You, uh, uh, was it possible just uh, add data to the end of the VEC? Uh, that that's one of my speculation. Another speculation is that in for in hardware, uh, certain certain uh, operations, you just you know you move data, and uh, you move data out of its physical bound. So those those things are automatically removed. I wonder if there are tricks for you to manipulate the vex. Oh. So you know certain operations can be. So you, you use some unsafe trick so, so that when the, the data uh, goes go beyond certain physical bounds, 
you you just you know naturally you you get some uh you get some savings <laughs> that's actually what's your comment i i think the word unsafe answers it maybe it you could by but you would have to go against everything that the rust uh compiler tells us to do also we just didn't think of it like i think well, yeah, oh yeah no we, we didn't think of it but uh, even now that you've proposed it i would not want to try it because i would have no idea how to avoid the memory errors that would come with that would come with doing something like that yeah, yeah, I think yeah it we, we it would never have occurred to us to even uh to, to even try to go that much against the memory safety of rust <laughs> got it thank you oh and felipe can i share my screen i absolutely not can i add a couple comments about the b tree okay um okay. yeah just uh by the way thanks david for the shout out i'm the one that suggested the b trees to david um I had suggested I I AVL trees and B trees as a, just a first guess. And the B tree worked well enough that it was no longer worth finding the optimal uh, data structure. Uh, of course, B trees are really intended to be used for like disk indexing and, and other things. And I'm just wondering if anybody has any ideas about what data structure might be optimal for that because you're inserting and deleting in memory. There's really no, uh, no offloading and the, uh, uh, the canned, uh, package or whatever you call it in rust that David used. Um, he just used the default parameters for the number of, uh, number of, items in each node and things like that. I'm just wondering if anybody knows what a what a better uh, data structure would be in this situation. And this was to store the the graph, not this. The, this wasn't this the was to store a sorted list of positions. Uh, we we no longer had any kind of graph by this point. So this was simply a list of positions along with a uh, an a parameter and it was sorted along that parameter and we needed to keep it sorted as we went. And I'd also be curious, I know there's no built-in AVL tree for Rust, though there are a few crates that implement it. I would be curious what built-in structure would be optimal, if anybody knows. I would start with a B tree uh, set. A uh, red black tree might be interesting to try, but it's not built in either. What would be interesting to try? A red black tree. Oh. I mean, I've always wanted to just do that outside of an interview question, so that could be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we we talked about that actually for a different Rust problem, uh, and we didn't end up using it for that. But that are there any are there any good crates for it? Do you know in Rust? Uh, no idea. I implemented my own version in Haskell and I had to use it. Oh, uh, fair enough. Does anyone know what the defaults are for the uh, the B tree right out of the box for the number of nodes or for the number of elements in a node? I have to check the source. Here, I'll post the source in, uh, I'll post this, the documentation of the source in the comments. Dad, I don't know. Can you see the chat? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's that is the uh, the B tree map. That's what we have. Okay. Great. Uh, so that's actually well. Technically, we have B tree set, but it's just, it's exactly the same trees. Um. It does mention, of course, it talks about in the documentation. By doing this, we reduce the number of allocations by a factor of b, but it doesn't actually say what b is. You would have to look. You'd have to look in the code, but the code right. is linked. The source code is linked in that documentation. Okay, I'm looking at it now. Thanks. Excellent. Why and, do I see another project coming along? <laughs> uh, <laughs> not not anytime soon. I can tell you that this took up more than enough time already. I did want to. I did want to share. So earlier, uh, Scott, I believe you were asking about what different uh, well heights would look like. And I'll make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. So we did do a set of theme searches up to six and seven 
we were able to do, we are, we were able to definitively state this is the widest that the game tree ever gets. Um, past step seven, we passed a, a height of seven, we couldn't, but we were able to see, okay, what is the Mac, what's the best possible score with our current heuristic? So acknowledging that our current heuristic is not optimal. These are likely that I have this little greater than or equal to sign because it's likely better than this. But we got 8, 12, 17, 21, 28. Um, unfortunately, at this point, we had to step down another notch because of me memory issues. Hmm. So we go down in order of magnitude. 22, 24, 29, 32, 34, 39, 47. So there was a pretty huge jump for our heuristic with just that one extra line. Uh, and Scott's question was specifically saying, what's the difference between 15 and 16? Unfortunately, we can't do 17 with our current, uh, with our current code. Our current code was designed for the neural net and it has a fixed number of positions because the alpha zero algorithm requires a fixed number of positions. Uh, we'd have to rewrite a lot of stuff to get, it was pretty easy to modify it to say, oh, well, don't the, all these positions are just manually declared invalid. That was fine, but declaring, <coughs> adding extra ones uh, would require a decent size rewrite and we haven't, had, we haven't had the time, but I am interested to see what would happen if you did. Because if, if you made the, if, in other words, if you made the well twice as tall, I would expect you would have well way more than twice the possible maximum score. But you'd still have the time frame to deal with if you try to do it. Oh yeah, it would it would take longer. There's no doubt about it. And it would take up more memory too. Um I had a second question. So it seemed like you spent a lot of time talking about the encoding and trying to get the encoding <clears throat> of the positions uh, down. Um, it definitely makes sense that, okay, you need to store all of these, you're doing a lot of caching and then you, you have to like manage the work and move all of this data around. So if you get that smaller, like that makes more things possible. But with that though, like, so one was, the first part of the question is like, how much of that figuring out a good encoding and like, you know, eureka moments about like, oh, this is encoding. We can just like collapse this to, you know, something that's much smaller. How much of that was like an iterative thing that was happening over the course of the year versus like, okay, we'll do this first. Now that's done. Now we'll move on to the other piece. And then the second part of that is like, do you think that encoding was coming up with a good encoding was only? Uh, about like, okay, we just need to fit the data in a smaller space, or did that also help you think about, like think, having to think about the encoding and how things are represented, did that also help with like understanding heuristics and coming up with better heuristics and solving the problem itself? So Felipe, could you share to slide nine? No, yes. Uh, uh, um, so part of, part of the encoding, uh, we definitely planned out ahead of time, uh, we, we did plan out the U16, switching from Booleans to U16s fairly early on. Uh, we realized pretty early that we could collapse that. We still did the Boolean thing first because we just wanted something that was very simple and that worked. But at, we, we, we wanted a reference that we knew worked when we started doing the more complex stuff. But in terms of how much was planned, this was definitely planned, uh, the U16s. The, uh, the waveforms were definitely a eureka moment. Uh, that was not something we planned. And in fact, in, in terms of encoding to save space, there is an optimization we never did. The wells are 10 across and we're using 16-bit integers to store them, but the wells are 16 high. And so if we, instead of 20, of, uh, if we got rid of the top four rows, because you can never have a piece resting above the top, above the fourth line. If you do have a piece resting above the fourth line, you just lose. Uh, you can never have a piece resting above the, the top line. So the top four lines are always going to be zero when you're storing the move in the graph. 
or in the beam search. And we real that meant the effective height was 16. And if we switched the well, uh, could you go to slide 11? If instead of going across, we went up and down, we could store it in 10 16 bit integers instead of 20 16 bit integers. And we could store it all in half the space. Um, we never did that because we'd have to convert it back into the way it was for the emulator, but it was a possibility. It was something we thought of. I, I will say most of the reasons we changed how we did the emulator or changed how we represented data was in response to seeing flame graphs where it was like, oh, this is a blocker or, oh, we need to find a better way to tackle this part of the problem because we're just not generating moves quickly enough to keep up with the amount of moves we have to make. Yeah, the speed, the, the space rather, wasn't really the limiting factor until much later in the project. Right, it was primarily speed at first. The idea of the cache was to trade memory for speed, right? Yep. And you also asked, did this give us an idea, a better idea for the heuristics? And it did. Uh, Felipe, could you go to slide 38? I can. So the heuristic we ended up doing, it involved counting holes. And the same, the same principle behind waveforms, we realized we could actually use this to count holes and to count enclosed holes um, by simply having, at, at first, we, we did all this in a hash map. We started at the top, we propagated down, and any empty squares, so to speak, that we hadn't hit by the time we uh, had propagated all the way through with Dexter's algorithm, any squares that we hadn't hit were just were uh, uh, enclosed. They were unreachable. They, you couldn't get there from the surface. But we did realize that we could use the same principle as uh, of the bit shifting. And we could, also, we could also use that to get holes and enclosed holes. We could, do, we could propagate downwards by saying, if this row and not the next one, then propagate surface. Uh, so it did give us an idea on how to speed up the heuristic too, but it didn't really give us any ideas for new heuristics per se. It also contributed to Dave's descent into madness where he could look at random strings of numbers and be like, I guess this is a well that is stacked up to this height and looks like this. I'd be like, okay, if you say so. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time staring at output logs uh, for this. In, in fact, on slide 40, we have we have a couple slides just documenting the descent into madness here. On slide forty, we were training the neural net, and we we had a bug at this point that sometimes the neural net would get stuck and only return zeros. I was staring at the output log. I saw that number, and I messaged Felipe and said we have the bug again. Because the only possible way to get this particular number would be if the value head was outputting zeros, again. This, you, you can see it has far fewer decimal points than it should. And it ends with 21875, which is the sort of ending that you only get if it's a fraction of a power of two. Um, because of the way the value head loss was working, it was based on, you, ha you had some normalization stuff, but it was based on the actual score minus the predicted score. And normally the neural net predicts some decimal. It doesn't predict an exact score, it says, Oh, predicted score is 1.45 or something. The only way that you could get a perfect power of two, given that our mini batch size was a perfect power of two, is if this was an integer for every value. And the only way that could happen is if it was always outputting exactly zero. Um, and this is the sort of this is the sort of thing that happens with a lot of projects that uh, Sometimes you don't recognize until afterwards how uh, how much time you wasted on it, but there there's there is no substitute for staring at log files, as this mentions. I mean, could you say that the the real neural nets you made were the friend's brains you expect <laughs> away? Felipe could say that. I don't know <laughs> if I could say it. Does anyone else have any questions? 
Well, if not, I have to show you the next slide too, because this is also still in our code. Uh, this was from when we were hunting down the ghost node. We were putting in print statements everywhere. And Felipe's job was to put in sensible error messages like the missing child node thing and a message saying the priors are still missing after update grip of leaves. And my job was to go do, 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 and realize that that was the exact meter of Battle Hymn of the Republic and to write the rest of the stanza. Um, if, if this is this is one screenshot that perfectly encapsulates how the work breakdown went over the course of about 11 months, uh, we, we went nuts. But that's, that's part you, when you're this deep in, you make your own fun. And I'm pretty sure everyone here who's worked on programming projects uh, knows how that goes. That's fantastic. If, if you could do it all again, would you still do it in Rust? Yes. Yes. Uh, I've, I've worked with C++ a lot for my job. It's good. It's certainly fast. And New Jade's, uh, the previous record holder, his actually is in C++ and his is still on par with ours in terms of speed, if not faster. But I would still choose to do it in Rust because a lot of the memory safety stuff that we didn't have to deal with, that I do have to deal with with C++, uh, it, it's nice. I would definitely do it in Rust again. Plus it means get to post this Rust subreddit, which is, in, is a plus, <laughs> right? It's more active than the C++ subreddit. It's true, it's true. I'm not sure if you mentioned this earlier uh, and I missed it, but what exactly is it that you did that New Jade didn't that got you the 86? Better parameters. New Jade used a genetic algorithm to come up with the parameters. Uh, our parameters, for whatever reason, scaled better. And I actually have a suspicion that it was because of the simple X calibration. The, the way it picks points it maps everything out to a tetrahedron and or an n an n dimensional tetrahedron a simplex te technically uh, and it picks it picks points at the center of those simplexes um, and what this translates to is that you have a lot of parameters that are tied because a lot of times you are picking points on the corners of things bayesian optimization you have all kinds of real numbers you have gaussian distributions and whatnot your numbers look random but with simplex, you get a lot of uh, a lot of times where parameters are identical. We suspect that that's actually helped it scale better, because with a beam search, uh, go to slide thirty nine. With a beam search, you're continually throwing out uh, bad nodes. So if you have a beam width of two, and these are your rankings for every uh, every time. You're just taking numbers one and two. You're not exploring the children of any of the others. And what we saw that would happen is that we would, we would lose the variety that we wanted. We would go down one path and eventually we'd end up where, with something like this left path has all of the children that we're looking at, even if the right path it could potentially compete. And having a lot of ties meant that we weren't doing that sort of filtering out. We had a lot more variety much later down the road. Uh, New Jade's heuristic did not have any ties in it. Uh, the genetic algorithm looked a lot more random than ours. I suspect that's what happened. It was easier to get caught in a globe, in a local maximum because you filtered too much too early. Right, now you started with the parameters he gave you. Yes. And you said that even with those parameters, you were not able to get the 66 that he got. There must be either some subtle bug right. in his code or some subtle difference in implementation or something. He got okay. 66, we got 53. So right. it was clearly close, but yeah, we, mm -hmm. we couldn't just replicate it. So how did you modify that? Did, was that the genetic algorithm you said you modified it with or? No, no, we, uh, we just used the Rust. Uh, we used Rust to just run a ho whole bunch of smaller beam searches. Um, I see. Yeah, we, we ran a whole bunch of smaller beam searches and we used those to uh, generate the points where we wanted. Uh, we, we just picked, this isn't the, this isn't the run we actually use. Uh, the one we actually used, it was a bit more even than this. And uh, we just saw one of those points 
on this graph. We said that point looks good and we picked it. I know you're a huge fan of genetic algorithms, which is why you're asking, but sadly we did not use any. I don't know if there are good rust crates for them. So speaking of like rust crate gaps, are, mm -hmm. are there any other ones that really stand out to you that would be kind of nice to have? Uh, I like talked this? about, yeah, I, I talked about that one. Um, that one's potentially addressable with uh, PyO3, which is the Python, you might know it, it's the Python integration rust crate. Uh, we, I, we got that working in one environment. We could not get it working in the other probably be, because the, uh, the, C plus, the C linker failed. And we made a lot of modifications to the C linker when we were working on GPU stuff, which we didn't even talk about in the, in the presentation. So that's probably our fault. It wouldn't be too hard to make a crate that was just a bunch of bindings to the Python uh, optimization module. But that's the, one, that's the one that stands out most for me. Uh, what about you, Felipe? Or I can't really think of any other than Bayes and optimization stuff we ran into. I'm sure that if we go back through our chat logs, we'll be like, oh man, if only there had been a better crate for X, Y, and Z, but I can't think of it offhand. I mean, the TCH was nice. It's a level below what you would have with something like TensorFlow. Uh, but there's nothing, you, you can do everything with it that you can do with TensorFlow. You're just going to have to sit. TensorFlow will, for instance, give you the neural architecture ahead of time. With TCH, you have to build that neural architecture yourself, but you have all the building blocks to do it. Yeah, but um, I will say about TCH not, is the documentation could have been more thorough in its examples. That's true. Well, to be fair, the TCH is maintained by one person. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm not absolutely, absolutely. I'm not, it's not a criticism of TCH. It's if in a perfect world where I get to change the Rust ecosystem. Right, yes. That If that had better uh, documentation, it would have been, it would have been a lot easier to do some of the neural network stuff. Um, talking about Torch, uh, I know you didn't end up using the neural network in the end solution, but what uh, architectures did you try or how did you encode the inputs? Like how did you show the, the game state to the neural network? Uh, go to slide 36. All right, so there's, <clears throat> um, there's a, we took the idea from AlphaZero itself and we, we made one fundamental change so in, uh, in AlphaZero, you have this big, uh, this big uh, 19 by 19 by 17 uh, stack. And we, we had a much simpler stack. We only had about 2,400 different possible positions. And so we just had a 2450 by one uh, array. And that was our... Uh, that was our game state. And in order to generate, I think the next slide goes into even more details. Uh, there we go. So on the left, oh man, even now you, you can't really see it, but you have two heads. You have a value head and a policy head. And the value head, broadly speaking, it, uh, it tells you how good you expect it to be. If you have a game like chess, it'll give you a one if it expects a 100% chance of victory and a negative one if it's a 100% chance of defeat. Ours was a little different because we were predicting score, not just you know one uh, win, a loss, or a draw. Uh, but it's the same idea, and we used exactly the same architecture for it. Uh, the policy head tells you for every single position, here are the odds that this position will be the one you ended up taking. And so if you think about it, the policy head it's sort of like you have a, a, it, you, if, you're a, if you're a chess master, you don't look uniformly at all the possible positions on the board. There's a couple that stand out to you and those are the ones you investigate. The policy head, that's its job as well. Um, yeah, so you don't always take the highest value. Uh, we don't no. always take, no, we, don't. We, balance, we balance the, uh, the value with the pol with the policy itself, yeah, yeah, uh, so especially when we're looking for new moves. Okay, okay. So, uh, and you just gave the state, like the game state, raw. You didn't do any kind of feature engineering or like calculating. I don't know, like the uh, even basic stuff, like the highest 
uh, field position or just kind no. of digest it so that, yeah. No yeah. feature engineering. And that was something that we suspect at the time came back to bite us. Mm. Um, I, Felipe, is it possible to zoom in while presenting? I'm trying. It's not doing right. anything. Well, right, actually, no. Move. Keep your mouth right where it was. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, there uh, we go. Now, where do you want the mouse? Uh, move down slightly to those stacks. Uh, so those st those stacks. I know this is not a uh, is not great, but those stacks that are just are three by three specifically. Hmm. Um. Those are designed. Those assume that in in Go, and that's what this diagram is for. In Go, nearby positions influence each other, mm -hmm. and so you apply convolutional filters to these three by three subsets of your entire nineteen by nineteen grid. Yeah, because that's the thing with like AlphaGo for chess and Go, and also for like Atari and such. Well, it's not the same model, but it's more you are looking at kind of the image. Uh, yep. which is different in Tetris, I guess, or if you encode the states in a different way. So yeah, yes. it, it well, is we, we, like so spatial we encode, we encode the positions in the way you would expect. We encode mm -hmm. the positions as just 20 by 10 Booleans. Okay, like, uh, yeah, pixels. So, like the, like the, the well, the well rather, I'm sorry. Right, right. Yeah, we, right. Yeah, we encode the well geometrically because, yeah, like you, like you said, it's image-based. This mm -hmm. whole algorithm is image-based. But the output is... We did no feature engineering on the output, and we did no feature engineering on the input besides just taking advantage of the fact that it is an image and nearby piece, nearby squares influence each other. We had no uh, we had no extra neurons for maximum well height or what what move what piece is legal. We didn't have any of that. So you said that you didn't end up using it for mainly technical reasons, or uh, we just couldn't get a good enough score. The best score we ever got with this was twenty. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'll uh, add that that was probably due to the fact that we had very small training sets in the traditional AlphaGo thing. You play millions of games, and then you play against you have networks play against each other, and then you train on those millions of games. I think we generated like. 10,000 games across like two weeks or something like that. So we yep. just have great training set data, tra great training data to work with, with basically. And the other uh, problem we faced was the fact that we didn't know how to randomize it. When you have chess, there is a certain degree of randomization because when you're playing against the network, you're playing as a slightly different version of the network. Um, at least that's what AlphaGo does. That's what AlphaZero does. With us, it's single player. Yeah. And we would have to introduce a lot of noise for it to not just always pick the same moves or the same handful of moves over and over again. We definitely did do that, though. We had a whole discussion about that. the noise um, factor. Yeah, we had, uh, what was it, Perlin noise? I don't remember. It was some person's name noise. Yeah. Dirichlet yeah, noise. <laughs> Dirich, yeah, Dirichlet noise for uh, when searching within the tree. Um, not Perlin noise. Perlin noise is an image thing. Dirichlet noise within the tree, but even that, we had to turn up that noise very high in order to get a wide variety of results. The results we all got, ironically, felt a lot like human strategies. Hmm. They, they were all about pseudo loops. They were all about taking the same basic sequence of moves and applying them over and over again, which is kind of funny that the human, the, the new trade heuristic is, a human being can understand that. It's a pretty small number of parameters and it produces games that are totally alien. <laughs> the MCTS produces this totally alien neural network and gives us very human looking games. Uh, and I, I found that quite amusing. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, it's the same problem as always in reinforcement learning, like the yep. exploration uh, versus exploitation. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're not the first people that encounter this yeah. problem. We're not gonna be the last. Now, um, did you consider any kind of unsupervised learning algorithms? It looks like what you're talking about here is a supervised network. No, this is this is 100% unsupervised. It's unsupervised. Okay. Yes. And you uh, said you can't do supervised because you didn't have a big enough training set. Is that correct. Right? Gotcha. Correct. There so just... what you mean there, it, it, was it still that the emulator was a bottleneck, even with a large network? You emulator? Learned... 
emulator was a bottleneck we didn't have the waveforms at this point so if we did it now our emulator would be about 10 times faster um and 10 times as many games would definitely make a difference but we're not sure it would be enough of a difference yeah if we ran this for a year and let it 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 might be enough there's also the fundamental issue of we have to use the net to generate the next generation of games and the net process is just very slow without a lot of integrated hardware Oh, good point. Yes, the net would actually be our, our bottleneck now. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, that's what I was wondering. Because at one po- uh, at some point, if you have a large model, like the speed of the emulator doesn't matter as much. Right, yes. Yeah. yeah, the emulator was a limiting factor for the initial runs where we just had no data yet. But once we had the data, it was like our training time was like four weeks at one point. Well, it was four weeks to play all the games and then train. And then train. The network but- only took about a day. Oh, okay. Playing the games would take weeks, yes. Yes, and then rerunning them with the network took even longer. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks. I have a kind of a side question for each of you. What would you say? I mean, you brought a lot of different modalities into creating this. During that time, what would you say was the most eye-opening to each of you individually as far as things that you could apply across different other things that you work with what surprised you if that makes sense uh, i can start actually flame graphs flame graphs flame graphs flame graphs flame graphs flame graphs like i didn't realize where all the bottlenecks in my code could exist without me being aware of them because i don't often take time to measure performance of things and so knowing that I had tools to measure performance and that I should measure performance helped me in other code aspects. Uh, Maybe like a tool to track your benchmarks. Oh, did, were you the one who gave the talk a couple years that, ago with benchmark tracking? That, oh, it was last month. Um, oh, okay. That was, <laughs> never mind. I, I, well, I remember going through the list of previous talks and seeing that. Uh, yes, you were doing good. You were doing very important work with that. Thanks. Uh, man, Felipe, you stole my thunder there. Ha ha, at last. So you would say that that was like a major outcome was seeing the utility of, of that really brought, brought home, so to speak. I think yeah. fundamentally too, it's not just the tooling. It's just the idea that like there are ways to measure performance that aren't sit there and stare at your code for a while. I, I'd say mine, I would love to say that mine was learning how to implement alpha zero because at this point I could, well, maybe not now, but when we were doing this, I wrote and rewrote the thing a lot when we were doing our various iterations. I could probably almost do it from memory I would love to say that uh, that this is something that I intend to use in practical terms. You know, I'm a material scientist, and maybe, oh, maybe I can figure out how to encode uh, material properties in a uh, uh, into this input layer and get out uh, uh, get out new models that are more effective than current models at predicting other properties of those materials that we that are harder to uh, to predict. I'd love to say that, but fun as that is i don't think we're at the point quite yet where it's practical without a huge amount of compute and without a huge amount of additional work but i also don't think that this is the limit either like this is still a relatively simple architecture in the middle of the left hand side you see a little thing that says the network and the network consists of a value head and a policy head both attached to 40 different copies of the residual layer and that's, that's not nearly as complex an architecture as you could get. Now, I mean, we're not going to make it more complex because if we, chances are if we make it more complex at random, it, it'll be bad. But I think you could, like, this is not the limit. This is not as good as, uh, as self-learning neural networks can go. Someone we were talking to, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, but you mentioned Atari. There is a new version of AlphaZero designed for Atari games that does not rely on an internal emulator at all, that really does just play the game that 
internal emulator is also done by neural network. It learns the rules on the fly, so to speak. Our version, we have to have an internal emulator, but, uh, and we have to be able to, we have to know the rules exactly in order for it to do its game tree prediction. But the new versions like Mu Zero for Atari, and uh, I think there's even an, a new one more recent than that. The new versions don't even need that. They don't need an exact known mechanism. And that would be something that I think could be applied elsewhere, just not quite yet. Because I'm uh, seeing, as, I'm, as I've been watching you go through, part of me wonders if it could be used, you know, a lot of the pieces of this in working with um, theoretical physics to topology toward material research. I think it could, but not, but again, I don't think we're, we're at the point where I don't think the net, the, the algorithms, the architectures are, are that there yet. People have tried, but currently the results are not as good as the best, just human, uh, human made models and human so made not, uh, predictions for material properties. So it's not robust enough at this time for that type yeah. of application. Yep. You, and we don't, we don't have quite enough data in good formats. With materials specifically, it's there are thousands of little databases all in totally different formats because there is no one notation for all materials. If you have a if you have a plastic, that plastic consists of a whole bunch of carbon atoms in long chains that are all wound up and wrapped around each other. Compare that with something like a metal, where you have a bunch of different atoms and some carbon sprinkled in in a regular crystal structure. Right now, we have no way of, of of representing both of those things with the same notation. And well, then I guess that's a, no. Go for it. Uh, so it's more of like a fundamental modeling problem and getting that. Like, what what representation do you feed in as opposed exactly, to exactly? Yes, you know, like like a chess game board is a pretty solved yeah, chess game board is pretty uh, simple. You know. Yeah, I was looking from the from the perspective of the uh, different lattice structures that have been. Oh, explored. sure, it's been done what to an gave extent. Me the idea. It's been done to an extent for what I would say interpolation, where you have a very specific material and you're looking for small variations on it, and you want to predict which of these small variations is the best. There, you can do it because there yeah. you have a regular structure. Sure, <laughs> Have you what? seen the open catalysis and integrate? Have I seen the what now? Oh, sorry. Have you come across the open catalysis data set by chance? The uh, catalysis data? The open catalysis project? Oh, open catalysis. Uh, no. Who does that? Do you know? It's out of Carnegie Mellon. It was one of the guys I went to school with. Or the, I'm sorry, the open catalyst project. I, I forget. But oh, catal he, cat yeah. Okay. Um, you have a link Carnegie. For so I've, uh, I've, it's, I think it's opencatalystproject.org. Yes. I haven't looked at it for a while, but yes, uh, the open catalyst is is fascinating because that's that is talking about uh, uh, regular structures. The difficulty and all right, I am not going to to badmouth it because it is really really cool research, um, but it does rely on an internal representation that doesn't uh, that you couldn't use for huge materials. It sure. has representations of individual atoms. Um, which again, that is, that's amazing when you're looking for chemical properties, which they are, but when you're looking for something like, uh, if you're looking for something like a mechanical property, you want to know how strong this steel is. You need yeah. to be able to look at a macroscopic version and you're not going to get 10 to the 23 atoms in your, your representation. Oh yeah. Um, no, it was just one of the cooler. Um, it is real, seen, it at is least really to try to problem. standardize the data set because you're right like it otherwise the data sets a mess oh and i have um, no idea how you would do this <laughs> I, I i complain that it hasn't been done <laughs> i have the faintest idea what you would actually do to uh, to normalize it but well in order to uh, gamify your guys work what you should do is at least build uh a new version of tetris that you know incorporates different polarity <laughs> and different types of uh, interactions. Yeah, like the, like the protein folding. They've been so yeah. successful with that. Yeah, yeah that's true. They 
they got a version like or or maybe uh maybe tell my department that i'm doing that and just have it be regular <laughs> hatress and that way we get some uh some good games for our training set <laughs> I, I either idea is good uh i'm going to share my screen really quick so yeah, this thank is, you though. that was that was fun no yeah, thank you Th this is what he's talking about um this project here <laughs> It is very cool, but it's all about the chemical properties. Uh, you have to have your individual atoms in order for something like this to uh, to work. For pro protein folding, it is somewhat physical, isn't it? It's the kind of geometry of it. Uh, I know it's not the same as a material. Uh, no, it, it's, it's the same kind of problem because where do you draw the line between a chemical and a protein and a material? There are yeah, yeah. There really isn't a line. You know, you can you can and people have built stuff out of DNA. In fact, there was a whole competition called Biomod, uh, in which the challenge was to uh build stuff out of DNA. And mm -hmm. my favorite the the winning at one point was these self-assembled uh DNA origami smiley faces. <laughs> I remember uh, those. Yeah. And what they did, they they just had the uh um, this is obviously colored and everything, but the whole point, the whole point, the whole idea of this, you have your DNA and it will only bind with the other DNA strands in specific ways. And those specific ways will cause it to form these structures. Is this uh, an actual simulation? Because they are this pretty, is a simulation. This is not the, this pretty is good not the actual thing. <laughs> I, they did, uh, uh, they did, they did check it. It's not in the video. Uh, they did see with a atomic force microscope mm -hmm. that you did get some of these smileys, but you don't, you'll get the nice yellow color that you really want for a video with that. So they have the simulation for that one. But yeah, there's no, um, there's no real dividing line between a material and a chemical and a protein. And you would need something, you, you would need some rep way to represent all of them. And I have no idea how. And if you let Dave talk about this, we will actually be here all night hearing yes, about so material science and machine learning. Uh, 